A pleasant good morning to everyone, dear ladies, dear gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to the webinar organized by the American Chamber of Commerce and partners. These are Amgen, Gray PR, J. J, MSD, Microsoft, Novartis, and Roche. And today, within the framework of our 90-minute discussion, we'll be talking about how innovations will change the patient pathway in Slovakia. Our discussion is going to be held across two communication levels. The first level, we'll be talking about what's the patient care pathway today. The second level, we'll be talking about how the patient care pathway could be changed if we fully used digitalization, telemedicine, or AI, or in gene sequencing in uh, Slovak healthcare. It's very important that you also can join the discussion through Slido, well-known <coughs> application. I'd like to warn you that our program is going to be quite busy, so we might not be able to answer your questions, but we will certainly welcome any comments that we will appreciate and that will present very, uh, very important insight for further professional discussion. Uh, before we start with the presentation, let me introduce uh, the guests. On my right hand side, I'd like to welcome a journalist and also oncology patient Eva Slatkova. Welcome, Eva. Good morning. I'd like to welcome uh, dear guest, uh, as, uh, as Associate Professor Stefan Koretz, clinical oncologist. Good morning. And thanks to online technology, our discussion will also be, our discussion will also involve other four professionals. We start with the ladies, ladies first. Uh, Andrea Cipkova, oncologist, head of the East Slovakian Institute for Oncology in Košice. Can you hear us, head physician? Good morning, thank you. I'd like to welcome also Professor Lukas Plank, head uh, expert of the Ministry of uh, Health for Pathology, and also Dr. Peter Lipovsky, who is a GP, general practitioner. Good morning, doctor. Can you hear us? Good morning. Good morning to you too. So before we start with the presentation, I'd like to uh, inform you that most of the data that we will present, that we are going to present uh, in today's discussion is an estimate, it's because the most recent data from Oncology Register is from the year 2011. So, on, so I'd, like the, the to, I'd like you to show the first slide in our presentation. There are three figures that show the situation of oncology patients in Slovakia. In 2020, the number of newly diagnosed cases of oncological diseases in Slovak Republic for the first time will is likely to exceed uh, 40,000, the number of 40,000. This is the the prognostics of the development of oncology diseases or cancer diseases in Slovak Republic, which was published by the National Center for Healthcare Information on its website. At the same time, uh, we see another figure, 160. We calculated the, the pathway of oncology patients with uh, lung cancer from the first moment when the first suspicions appeared until the moment when uh, treatment is approved. Of course, these figures change across various diagnoses, but we need to point out that uh, cancer of lungs or lung cancer belongs among the most frequently diagnosed uh, cancer disease, and uh, around 2,000 Slovaks die with this diagnosis every year. What's more alarming is that almost three quarters see the specialist too late at stage three or four. And the last figure, minus 25%, sorry, 25%, <clears throat> this means that only one quarter of uh, recommended cancer treatments are available in Slovakia for patients. Next slide, please. We're convinced that using uh, innovative approaches and processes and using technologies such as AI uh, can help everyone in the system, both patients and physicians and the system as such. We see this across three pillars, patient, uh, physician and the system, the, the respective benefits or the strengths for the patient, uh, it's related to saving of lives, increasing quality of lives, faster or more accelerated diagnosis, innovative treatment. When it comes to physicians, the benefit is naturally in increasing the efficiency and saving of time. When it comes to the system as, as such, we are mainly talking about better financial allocation of funds or resources and uh, 
when we're talking about this, I'd like to inform you about one thing. We have a unique chance today. We stand a unique chance to draw funds from the recovery fund, EU recovery fund, but also operational program, uh, other operational programs of the EU. These funds should be invested so that to save more patients' lives in Slovakia so that we can reduce the mortality of oncology diseases. And what is very important, last but not least, also to save funds in the system as such. Next slide, please. We attempted to find answers by defining the respective stages that the patient goes through within the pathway and look at each of the phases in the, in the time context. Of course, there are different perspectives. For example, it would be very interesting to look at it from the perspective of a more efficient um, time spending from the physician's perspective or a more efficient uh, spending of funds from the state budget perspective. Of course, there are other there are other perspectives. And we also looked at the technologies. They are, they are coded with different colors. We start with yellow, that's CDSS, so a clinical decision support system, then AI, blue, IoT, telemedicine, NGS, that's next generation sequencing, and clinical studies. So all of these technical or technologies are coded with different colors so that they are easier to differ. Uh, or differ, uh, distinguish, um, and I mentioned there are two communication levels, but these, both of these communication levels will be, uh, will be uh, also, um, will also include a patient story. So I'm very happy that we have uh, with us here today a journalist and an oncology patient, Eva Slavkova. Eva, so first question for you: What was your patient story? Did you feel any any health issues or problems that forced you to see your GP or your patient pathway was a bit different or less usual, less typical? Well, my pathway was less typical, that's true, but we could say that, thanks God, it was less typical because uh, I managed to capture the disease quite probably early enough or, well, much earlier if I only felt, if I waited until I, I felt some problems. My eye grew smaller. It's called Horner syndrome. I never, didn't know that, but I just saw my uh, ophthalmologist who first told me that it's just some sort of reaction to cosmetics or some some new changes, novel changes in my life. So he prescribed me some ointment, and then after one month of applying this ointment, I see the situation. Well, it didn't get worse, but it didn't improve, and I noticed that also my some other functions of my eye are different and I realized this is not going to be funny and I, I was really scared and I started to look for another ophthalmologist and he, he told me, the second uh, the second doctor told me that this is not connected with the eye directly, this is Horner syndrome, that something is pushing on my veins that are related to the eye oh, and, and the nerves in the eye and he told me that I should immediately see a neurologist and I did that, it was just before Christmas Oh, actually, it was before the Christmas and the, between Christmas and the New Year, so it was really difficult to get a specialist. But because I was ready to pay something out of my own pocket, so I got to the neurologist quite early enough. She examined me and she said, "Well, she can't do anything about it, but I should go to the hospital immediately because when I'm hospitalized, I will be examined and tested." across all the specialties so that they find out what this Horner syndrome is causing. So she sent me to the Ruzhinov hospital in Bratislava. I went to the hospital and okay, they told me they, they will order me to get hospitalized in early January. So until I got to the hospital, it took, I mean, from the moment I noticed something wrong with my eye, until I got to the hospital, it took approximately 2.5 months. So you were hospitalized at the neurology department, yeah, neurology ward. I was hospitalized and they told me that I need various examinations and tests. So they planned those tests. So every day I had one test. First, I don't remember exactly how the, the sequence, but uh, they, of course, they I got the blood picture or CT of my brain. CT scan, um, X-ray, of course, blood count, yeah, and, and, and the X-ray showed that I have s some shadowings, they said shadowing, or, and they sent me to the CT because of this X-ray, and it and the CT proved that the thing that caused the Horner syndrome was, and what is actually pushing on my veins and nerves is actually uh, um, a tumor. 
So you stayed in the hospital until you were until you underwent surgery, or you were released, and then you uh, went again to the hospital. Well, I was lucky again because when I was hospitalized at the neurologic ward, I found out that one of the neurologists is a, an excellent neurologist and is a father of my friend. And this friend of mine agreed with uh, his father that this doctor will actually take take me under his wings and he was pushing mm, pushing all the other specialists to to get me all the all the uh, tests early enough and i was operated by perhaps the best uh, chest surgeon in slovakia and this this tumor was really demanding they were they actually had to consult a different specialist from um, cardiology cardiovascular department they even have to communicate with different different uh, hospital they were working on the tumor and i was i was in the hospital for, for approximately seven days until they made all the tests and uh, then they found out it's probably going to be a tumor but they weren't weren't sure first the pulmonologist said that it theoretically could be just an inflammation that needs to be taken out so i was hoping of course it's going to be inflammation and not tumor tumor and and it took one week and I went home for for a week and before the surgery. So I spent two days at home. I needed to just get rest from the hospital. Uh, but fr from the moment when they found out what it was, it took very short. Uh, probably also because my this this connection that I personal connection I had really helped me. I believe. So. Uh, after surgery, it probably was very fast, and we'll be talking about treatment, of course. But uh, so far, thank you very much. But there's one question that comes to me: Did you belong, or do you belong among the, the you know adherent patients? Do you were frequently seeing your regularly seeing your GP for preventive checks? Or well, I can't say I'm really a model patient. I've because I've never had a serious problem, you know, healthcare problem. So I felt like well, there's nothing wrong, nothing can go wrong. I'm healthy, I'm fine, and my GP is not proactive. She doesn't really invite me to preventive checks. But coincidentally, just one and a half year before they they diagnosed me with cancer, I went to um, a preventive check. One and a half year. Because I had some other problem, not a serious problem at all, but I went to my GP and, and she said, well, okay, well, you haven't been to a practic, practic, preventive checkup. And uh, they made a, a blood count and the blood count also in, involved um, later um, uh, X-ray of, of lungs. But th there was nothing in there. So perhaps I was at an early stage, at an early stage. Okay, now a question to Dr. Lipovsky, a GP. Hopefully you can hear us. Doctor, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. So what's your experience as a GP, as a general practitioner? What's your perspective in general, uh, uh, GP's um, perspective of, of preventive checks? Well, it's really true that Slovaks are a bit, uh, they, are, they sort of under underestimate the, the importance of preventive checks. What's your experience as a GP? Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to thank you for being able to, to join you. And thanks for the question, which is incredibly important, also historically. In the past, people were taught that the system will take care of them, the state, the government or the ministry will take care of them and will actively invite them to preventive checkups. Today, it's more or less a responsibility of you as an individual patient, but naturally, a proactive approach of a GP certainly help. It does help. And I think patients appreciate this as well. And I'm very happy about the technology that is gradually uh, introduced by uh, healthcare, uh, health insurance companies that the, they remind patients to take part or in a preventive check. We can differentiate the genders or sexes. I mean, I mean, women tend to be more responsible for their own health. We even had a campaign like take your guy to the preventive check. So considering that women are more responsible for uh, in terms of preventive checkups, they should also invite their husbands or partners to join them for the preventive checkup. So the trend is rather positive. The, the generation that is advancing now, that, that is becoming middle-aged, they are more used to being responsible for themselves and taking active responsibility for their health in their own hands, so to say, and they are not used to rely on the, on the government. Well, that's good news. 
Anyway, do you uh, look at the patient during preventive checks, or when when a patient sees you with a with a with a with a difficult with a difficulty, do you look at them as potential oncology patients, like potential cancer patients? Well, I have to say that the system supports us that we know exactly what are the most frequent oncology diseases, what are the most frequent types of cancer. So, uh, for example, we check the stool because uh, the, this is uh, so colon cancer is one of the most frequent ones. So we have to, we certainly do think about the most frequent oncological diseases, most frequent types of cancer in our preventive checkups. Of course, the more special types of cancer, then we have to sort of uh, get into that through questioning the patient if there is any any suspicion. So. Uh, this means that you believe that you have enough competence as a GP to be able to perform any or all the necessary tests that might detect a cancer in that patient, or would you like to get more competence in this? Well, absolutely essential process is a detailed case history, a detailed discussion with the patient, you know, no technology, no no uh, digital technology can replace a detailed uh, discussion with the patient, uh, any symptoms that the patient may notice. So the stage that we can influence essentially is obtaining enough data from the patient through case history discussion. And of course, there then come laboratory tests. Uh, I would perhaps welcome to include more parameters in the, in the laboratory testing indicated by the GPs. And we would certainly appreciate if we could indica indicate some of these tests some of the organs of the body as, as GPs and not only specialists. So if we look at the statistics, how many patients do you see per day? Well, in Slovakia, statistically, a GP has approximately 2,000 patients in his or her database, especially in these larger districts or wards. We even attacked the, the almost 2,800. And we have 70 to 90 cards open every day. So we get in contact with 70 to 90 patients. Of course, some of them require more time, some of them require less time. And not all of them see us physically, but the percentage of the number of patients that we can treat in a detailed way depends on the competences of the of the of our office of the medical office and here i would appreciate much more uh, competence given to nurses that could perhaps uh, deal with number of minor issues that the gp wouldn't have to deal with thank you very much you certainly have in your office also an oncology patient or cancer patient that underwent a surgery at a different workspace workplace or a different center and he or she is treated so do you have all the information about the patient? Was it his or her movement in the uh, pathway in the system? When he or she had surgery? What treatment is he or she indicated for? Whether the treatment was successful or it failed? Or does the patient get lost across his or her pathway? Well, most frequently uh, we learn about the patient pathway uh, when he or she is hospitalized, because when he or she leaves the hospital, they need to report back to their GP. So that's when we learn. It could be improved, but these possibilities are not used, really. And we would appreciate if the information uh, were provided to e-health system, not only to the specialists and hospitals, but also GPs could access the information if we are interested in actively following the patient pathway, even though he is in the care of other, other specialists. So that would be really appreciated. Thank you very much. We will now get to an in interesting figure related to communication between GPs and uh, specialists. This is based on the data from National Center of Healthcare Information from 2018. It should be on the screen. So in case of a uh, pulmonology patient or lung cancer patient, it takes approximately 87 days until the patient gets from a GP to a specialist. 
with different diagnoses can be even more than 90 days. And we're talking about almost 80,000 patients per year. Dr. Lipovsky, do you also have this kind of experience that this patient pathway or the, the, the section of the pathway from a GP to a specialist, it's so, so dire, if I may use that word? Well, it always depends whether uh, I have this diagnostic concern about the specific patient. You know, I appreciate what Ms. Slatkova said here that basically in Slovakia things work if someone really wants, if you have friends, if you have connections, you have friends who are specialists and I feel that something is wrong with this patient, I can refer him or her to the specialist. I had a similar, similar experience with one young patient who suffered hemophilia and I had suspicion that something was wrong there and from the time I x-rayed her chest until the surgery there was just two weeks so sometimes it's just a coincidence of factors so you need to focus as a GP you need to focus on the stories that really deserve that or cases that really de deserve that plus this includes good communication with the specialist here I would perhaps appreciate if certain things were standardized if, if there were fixed rules because often happens that you order a, a nurse orders the dates with specialists or appointments with specialists and this nurse doesn't know whether this is an urgent case or it's not an urgent case so this first communication with the nurse sometimes you need to you need to differentiate like this is an urgent patient he needs to be seen or she needs to be seen very very early and this patient can wait a couple of days a week so this is this would be really really helpful thank you very much you basically answered my next question i had in store because the question was directed at what needs to be changed in the system so that we can cut this time between a GP and a specialist. And you named it, you nailed it pretty much, that it's also about uh, cutting the communication between the nurse, but maybe going to the specialist directly. What is important at the moment? We outlined in this uh, discussion with Dr. Lipovsky this first line of the communication, how this looks like today. And now we'd like to talk to Assistant Professor Koretz, looking at the ideal world, so to say. So, Assistant Professor, how this could look like if we used modern innovation in Slovak healthcare? I will not mention the names. We talk about digitalization, telemedicine, artificial intelligence, etc., etc. Thank you very much for the question. Yes, if we used what is already available, technology that is already accessible and available, and if you use digitalization, AI, we would certainly be able to cut on this time, simplify the pathway, which would result in the reduction of mortality and saving of money in, in the end of the day. These are two important factors, reducing mortality and reducing the, the, the expenses, expenditures. Uh, doctor said very correctly at the beginning how the case history is key. I agree. They they taught us, listen to a patient, he or she will tell you the diagnose, diagnosis. We would really like to support this communication between a GP and a patient. So when the f patient first sees his or her GPs with symptoms, they should fill an electronic form where they will say what are the symptoms, when he or she felt them, and, and they may, not, may mention the things that uh, might highlight the possibility of oncology or disease or possibility of cancer. So when the patient sees the GP, the GP already has the basic information in front of him. And the second point mentioned by the doctor is also very important. Uh, we'd like to have a single communication software between physicians, so between a GP and a specialist. So from the very first moment when a patient sees their GP, this information is filled or fed in into the software. You can imagine this as, a, as an assembly line or a library like in Volkswagen, when they assemble a car, everybody puts a, a wheel or a body or an engine, you know what I mean? And the, and the car moves on and it collects all the information of the, uh, about the patient. So at every point, the GP or any physician knows where the patient is, what has been done to him or her, what sort of treatment or, or surgery. And it's a two-way 
two-way direction, from GP to the specialist and back. Moreover, this could also include direct uh, setting of appointments with specialists. So a GP, so GP has highlighted five pulmonologists who could be available. These four are busy. The fifth one is perhaps 25 kilometers from uh, this town, but he can see the patient immediately. Right, let's go. Moreover, when these patients will move in this, in this, across this pathway, they will be there will be reduction of duplicity testing. This means that the patient has uh, one test performed at the beginning, and in this middle middle part on this backbone, he or she is moving across this universal communication system. The test is in there. So when the patient sees the specialist, a pulmonologist, there will be highlight. Okay, this guy or this, this this patient has underwent has undergone this and this testing. So this pulmonologist doesn't have to indicate yet another testing. So at the level of a GP, this is a communication system involving the patient and the GP. And on the other side, it will be communication system between the physicians, between the GP and a specialist. This is all within the standard mantinals of diagnostic and therapeutic standards, and the respective stages are basically put in there like pieces of the backbone or be beads on a necklace, if you like. Every single physician uses their software, but this universal software is able to, to take the data and upload it to the backbone. Okay, we'll get to this uh, this chart or this scheme uh, several times, but let me now return to the specialists. If if we have a model example of uh, a lung cancer patient, what testing is indicated by pulmonology pulmonology specialist when uh, such patient is referred to him or her from a GP's office? Well, the patient sees the specialist, the pulmonologist, and <clears throat> there's already a basic case history and basic testing that has been performed by the GP, and the pulmonologist decides. We still are moving within the standard recommendations, the guidelines. The patient with these symptoms and these tests, and with this clinical picture, the best steps are steps one, step two, step three, to do CT as soon as possible, because obviously the physician will use will take advantage of his or her knowledge or using the standards, the guidelines, so that within the guidelines they can approach the most correct and the fastest diagnostic method. So it can be CT, it could be MR scan or uh, function. Again, the, the, the slide, please. Artificial intelligence not only uh, helps in case of CT or MR, but it accelerates the process and it can even suggest to the physician, yes, the patient in the right part of the lungs, there is a focus which is quite, which is best accessible for biopsy, so it increases the speed. Uh, Dr. Lipovsky, GP, you're still with us. Um, we mentioned that this this, this uh, sequence of events between a GP and a specialist takes uh, almost three months. <clears throat> Do you believe that this is also caused by lack of specialists in Slovakia, in, in, in this case pulmonologists? Or it's only about the system that is wrongly set up? Well, uh, this question, as, as we hear often uh, across the society as a whole, you know, we uh, we work in the system where healthcare is often abused. Patient or misused. Patient is used. Uh, patient is treated with a specialist. He, they are not satisfied, so they see another specialist, and they ask for the same test from a different specialist. And the specialists are flooded with a number of. Uh, tests or appointments or examinations that they do not necessarily need to perform. So I'd like to point out that there should be fixed, clear rules for specialists to deal with patients whom they need to deal with. Certainly it's also a question of a primary sphere. If a, 
if nurses perhaps would reduce the load of the GPs, we would really need more nurses at our offices. So if organization of the primary care, so the GP care would change, this would result in GPs taking, providing more care to the patients who do not necessarily need to look for specialists. And the specialists could deal with the serious cases, like lung cancer patients. So I wouldn't say we have necessarily too few uh, physicians who are specialists. Perhaps the thing is that the, the system is kind of wrong. There are so, so there's a huge pressure of patients of, on the specialists and they require for examinations tests that are not necessary. <clears throat> so Eva, what was your patient experience when you were seeing your specialist? N not a pulmonologist, you said you, you saw um, ophthalmologists and neurologists. What were the waiting times? Well, the first one, the Okay, let me put it this way. The first ophthalmologist, I went to Mitna Polyclinics in Bratislava, so I had first I had to find an ophthalmologist because I had not had any before that. So I went to Mitna. Uh, I don't remember exactly if I had to pay anything out of my own pocket, but she saw me quite quickly and she diagnosed me incorrectly. So I decided to find another ophthalmologist who would uh, take a better look or give me a second opinion because it seemed to me that diagnosis cannot be okay. And I went to a, a, a private ophthalmology center. I was paying quite uh, substantial sums and they saw me immediately. It was just before Christmas. They were the only ophthalmology center they were willing to take me, or willing to saw me, but uh, well, there was out-of-pocket payment involved. And they told me there was this Horner syndrome and then I need to see a neurologist. I had a neurologist before that. She first gave me a time for, at the end of January. So it was, it was end of December and it was end of January. I thought like, you can't be joking. You must be joking if, if there's, uh, there's a suspicion that I could have a cancer in my brain and I'll be waiting until the end of January. And she said, well, okay, if I'm ready to pay out of my pocket, she will see me in the, in the period before the, between Christmas and the New Year. So, of course, I did make this payment, extra payment, so she was quite fast, and she referred me to hospital, and I went to the hospital the same day. And in the hospital, they told me that, okay, at the early January, they would hospitalize me. And, <clears throat> but also, they warned me, like, they are, they are about to paint the walls in the hospital, so, so uh, they have to first call me and they, of course, postpone the date. So I don't remember exactly, but I think it was mid-January when they hospitalized me. Thank you. We mentioned with uh, GP, Mr. Uh, Physician Lipovsky, we said that the first the GP make, uh, prof indicates uh, some tests. The doc, uh, assistant Professor Koretz mentioned what are the tests performed by the specialist pulmonologist. We still talked about this model pathway. But now we'd like to get in touch with the head, head uh, of, the, uh, of the East uh, Oncology Institute, uh, Ms. Tipkova. Ms. Tipkova, when you see the patient in your institute, do you have a full set of tests from the specialists or do you uh, perform the testing of the patients again, or in case if, if the patient has any test results, you dupli duplicate the like CT or MR scan. What, what do you do in this respect? Thank you. Well, of course, uh, uh, usually the patient doesn't come with a complex documentation to the oncology uh, examination. We have a fixed uh, steps in our institute. If we have cancer, a patient with a lung diagnosis, we have a multidisciplinary com committee meeting once a week. We have radiation specialists, clinical oncologists, and pulmonologists. Uh, sometimes a surgeon is on the phone uh, in case a consultation uh, is, uh, is necessary. And the patient comes with histologically verified diagnosis. This is what we expect. Very. <clears throat> 
uh, very, very rarely we only have a suspected cancer. Usually we have histology. In case there is just a suspicion, we send the we refer the patient back to pulmonologist to to verify the histology. But we can do the histology also on our own because we have histology center. We can perform biopsy under CT control. We can perform this in a relatively short time. When it comes to the the, the tests or examinations that patients come with, usually these are just partial examinations, partial examinations like CT of lungs. We need to uh, emphasize that patients with oncology diagnosis should have overall CT of their overall body so that we can stage the patients correctly. So the stage the patient meaning to, to, to <clears throat> determine the phase of the patient and depending on the phase to set up the oncology treatment correctly. When it comes to other tests like uh, PCT, uh, like CT, the, the patients, many, many patients require this test, but it is only recommended, it's not required. I mean, uh, you, uh, sonography of, of chest and other tests are additional, additional, not required. So a standard is the CT of the whole body that we need to stage the patient correctly or to, to determine the face of the disease. Whether there are any duplicity or repeated testing, well, yes, it does happen, especially in cases when, for example, the CT is performed with a relatively uh, a long time delay. I mean, if it was months ago. So when the patient sees us, until we diagnose the patient, there's there's some time that uh, has already elapsed, elapsed, and it can be quite irrelevant because we know that cancer can be quite dynamic disease. So for us, it's very important to perform the entry, the entry CT, so that we can measure the treatment effect. So if I understand correctly, most of these tests are performed directly in your institute. <laughs> so perhaps the process is not. Uh, perform like you give the patient an application, so he or she goes to CT or MR in a different uh, work center. You perform all of this within your own institute. Yes, some of the tests are performed in our um, institute, but we, you need to realize that we have patients from across all of the eastern Slovakia, not only Kosice, and there are various possibilities. How quickly we need the given <coughs> test, whether we need it because of, because of some clinical symptoms or we need the, the test because of differential diagnostics. We know that patient is called to the treatment in a certain time interval. So if these patients come from, uh, from a more uh, distant city or town, we can recommend the test and the, the oncology uh, patient should be give pr given preferential treatment and usually these, treat these tests can be done also in their local local towns or cities. Can you estimate the the time span? How long does it take? How many days? How many weeks until the patient has the perhaps the the the, mo, the more demanding test like MR scan? Well, there are various situations. Again, uh, we deal with this. Uh, using the system that I just described, if there is a patient that comes to us, they have clinical um, uh, clinical symptoms like uh, brain metastasis, we deal with this patient urgently. So immediately, we not only recommend the the the, the test, we want to arrange it immediately. We have a we have a. Uh, a, a provider who performs these tests in our building directly, so they give preferential treatment to these patients. And in case of clinical uh, symptoms, usually we are able to do this MR scan within one week. But if there are things like, you know, you have, there are Christmas and the, the MR is not working, we have the CT because we can quickly refer to pac the patient to urgent CT and we can perform the CT within one or two days. So this is your uh, one week solution. If we talk about magnetic resonance only for differential diagnosis of of an asymptomatic non-symptomatic patients when we want to we want to uh, rule out the brain metastasis or we want to see his liver or her liver then usually we are able to do this within 3 weeks usually 3 weeks is the maximum number and thank you now i hope this is not an in in impolite question but if you described in a detailed way what are the tests that the patient undergo within uh, under a clinical oncologist treatment do you think the system is set up correctly that from a gp the patient goes to a 
pulmonologist and then clinical oncologist? Or do you think that the patient pathway could be cut if, they have, if, if the GP has more competence, so he or she, the GP, could perform the more complex testing and directly from the GP they could see the clinical oncologist? Well, I don't think that the, the movement of patients from, uh, from a GP to clinical oncologist is correct. I believe that pulmonologist plays a very important role, essential role. It's also because the pulmonologists themselves, they can perform biopsies with a follow-up histology. So I think that the patient should still see the pulmonologist before he goes to clinical oncology. Thank you very much. Now there's a time for docent Koretz and uh, now we're getting to from the communication level uh, of as it is today to the communication level as it could be in an ideal world. So assistant professor, how we could accelerate the patient pathway uh, with using modern technological innovation, especially when we talk about diagnostics and um, testing. Thank you very much, head physician. I totally agree 100% with you, by the way. So yes, I agree with the head of the East Slovakian Oncology Institute that this, that this stage of, uh, of the specialist is very important because the pulmonologist, he's or she's an expert who can perform, you know, they know when they're supposed to perform bronchoscopy or biopsy or um, biopsy through chest. They all know this and they can consult the software that still keeps them within the marginals, within the envelope of standard testing. And moreover, it if it suggests the best way, uh, best location for biopsy. Let me emphasize once again, cancer is not cancer until it is proven histologically. So this, he or she as a specialist, they first need to get the tissue for histology testing and uh, also uh, <clears throat> preliminary staging. So CT, MR, mammography or X-ray, again, according to the to the guidelines, to the standards, and there comes AI that helps with interpretation. Many physicians don't like this. They say, AI will not replace me. Of course it will not replace you. Of course it will not substitute you, but AI may increase your efficiency, just like a computer in a bank increases efficiency of the bank teller. But signatures and responsibilities are always with the physician. Anyway, I mentioned AI. Uh, so assisted selection of the most suitable uh, location for biopsy. And when this is performed by AI, then the clinical clinical oncologist has a more has easier position. We're still moving across the across the uh, timeline. We're still moving across this timeline of this single universal software. Slide nine, please. Slide nine. Well, everything is uploaded on this single assembly line, metaphorically speaking. This green line, this is the universal communication system. This is the assembly line where all the physicians feed in the data. The GP fed in their test results. Specialists uh, fed in the results of their specialized um, uh, testing or examinations. And this goes along, this moves along together with assisted interpretation and AI. We have now biopsy and now we're getting to pathology. And perhaps I will give over the floor to you now. Yes, of course, we are going to talk about pathology very soon. But let me first put one question to head physician Sipkova. When you have evaluated the results of the tests, then you probably decide whether the patient is uh, operable or inoperable. Do you communicate in this respect with other experts, for example, um, chest surger surgeons? So imagine situation, the patient is being sort of discussed. So do you well, again, the situations can be very different. The first situation is, occurs when the pulmonologist who performs the histology test and he or she can see the CT results, they refer the patient to consultancy to surgical center. This is where we see the patient after the surgery. 
The second situation, which is also quite possible and it's quite correct, when the patient is evaluated through this multidisciplinary committee in our institute and when we evaluate the patient as operable, we refer the patient with a complete documentation to consultancy, to the surgeon, or we can directly uh, connect to surgeon, which is, um, in our case, it is our professor in, a, in, a, in the Kosice hospital, and we can, uh, over the phone, we can agree the consultancy and perhaps the surgery. So preoperative checks are performed in your uh, East Slovakian Oncology Institute or they are performed by the GP? No, pre-operative checks are not performed in our institute. It is usually performed by a GP. Yes, uh, pre-operative checks by the GP, yes. Okay, there's one more slide that shows that as many as 54% of patients see the clinical oncologist at stage four or phase four of the disease. Can you confirm this? And if it's correct, why this happens? Why this is so? Why, stay, why is phase four? Uh, yes, unfortunately, yes. It's not only about lung cancer, but many other cancers as well. Patients see us at later phases, often in metastatic stages or phases. It's not a good situation, naturally, because we know that early diagnostics or early diagnosis can significantly improve the prognostics of the patients. It's phase one. Uh, we have five-year survival rate. It's approximately 50, 60 uh, percent. And of course, with higher uh, phase, the prognosis deter deteriorates significantly. The reasons why patients see us so late, there are various. One of the causes, just like with other types of cancer, lung carcinoma doesn't does not have significant clinical symptoms even at stage four or phase four there can be minimal symptoms and even physical checkup with the practical uh, with a gp can be quite normal unfortunately we also need to take into account the number of patients who are lung cancer patients they are strong smokers many of them so They've been smoking for many years, they have various clinical symptoms like cough, so they don't believe that when the intensity of coughing changes or the, the character of coughing changes, they don't believe it's a problem and they don't see the GP. So it's very important to increase awareness of GPs in terms of any change in the intensity of coughing, chest pain, bone pain, other symptoms like weakness, fatigue, uh, increased higher fever. Uh, which is typical for for uh, lung patients, that they can point out that there's been some development, some change of, of, of health care status, and we need to, or they need to perform testing. When it comes to other causes, why people, why patients see us so late, well, there's no, basically no streaming for lung cancer patients. This is one of the factors. You know, in the United States, for example, since 2014, uh, there's there's been screening of patients. These were asymptomatic patients, but with very significant smoking case history. They are screened with low dose CT and it was found out that the mortality, uh, lung cancer mortality was declining or went to decline. In the EU, this role of screening is not quite clear. I think two years ago, at the World Pulmonology Congress, there were some results of clinical study published which also involved screening of asymptomatic patients, but with heavy smoking case history, and they were monitored at several intervals, I think in year two and year six. And we also found out, or they also found out, the significant decrease in mortality on lung cancer, even evaluating asymptomatic men and women. In women, the decline in mortality was even more pronounced. Thank you very much, head physician. Uh, doctor, do you agree with this uh, with this perspective uh, by the head physician from uh, East Slovakian Oncology Institute? Or, you know, when we talk about prevention with you, do you believe that screening or better prevention of uh, patients could improve this these poor statistics? I have to agree with one point or the finding that I heard that screening, especially respiratory infects or respiratory diseases, uh, is currently insufficient compared to what we had in the past. We know that there was a, we had in the past, we had quite strong emphasis put on imaging methods of lungs or respiratory system as a whole, there was more regular 
monitoring more regular x-rays of, of chest, basically, to put simply. After a certain time, there was a there was some sort of um, uh, the, the the this intensity of X-rays fell, and I believe that if we introduced it in in a uh, in the standards treatment standards, just like we have ECG for cardiology, so maybe we could include chest X-ray as as a basic component of of a preventive checkup. Perhaps we would have to ask the. Uh, we could ask the health insurance companies if if the if the preventive checkup doesn't include chest X-ray, they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't uh, reimburse it or something like that. So that <clears throat> so that it would motivate the physicians, the GPs, to be more thorough in their preventive checkup. So yeah, it is a good point made. So we we could also improve this part of preventive uh, treatment by the GPs. Thank you very much. Again, docent, uh, sorry, Assistant Professor Koretz, we are again talking about the patient pathway when it's decided whether we are going to uh, operate, whether the patient is going to undergo surgery or not. How can AI help the or support decision-making process? Well, again, I'd like to return one step further. There's Professor Plank, so that the committee can decide they need to have a pathology finding. I know that we have pathology pathologists set up for later, but perhaps we could talk to the pathologists. Professor, can you hear us? Professor Plank, pathologist, can you hear us? Morning, yes, I can hear you. was a correct uh, uh, remark from Mr. Koretz. Uh, you are pathologists, you examine the, the tissue specimen collected from the patient. Uh, I, I expect you, you, you work in the, the hosp university hospital uh, in the town of Martin, so the, I, I suppose that the tissue is available immediately, but uh, specimens from other hospitals or offices perhaps are available within several hours. But how, how is it in case of uh, specimen in other pathology centers? What's the interval? Basically, in every pathology center, we work with the same system from the moment when the door is open and the specimen enters the laboratory un until creating uh, histology preparation there's a certain time interval and uh, th there are pro th we need to process the tissue we need to cut it we need to dye it with colors and then we have histology preparation i can so this is how it looks like this histology preparation of one specific cancer and this preparation is then, or this specimen is then analyzed under microscope. So if the material is from our university hospital, I receive the, the specimen immediately, or the tissue immediately, and it takes usually not more than 48 hours, so two days, until I can uh, examine the specimen under a microscope. We cannot cut this time because the processing method of the tissue you know, it's like like a cooking process. If you want to bake a good cake, you cannot cut down on the time because the ba the, the, the the cake is not going to be good. So we cannot process, we cannot cut down on the time of processing the tissue because we could damage the tissue and the diagnostic processes would be just wrong. When it comes to consultancy, because our we are basically a consultancy center for specific uh, types of cancer, naturally there it depends the, the time interval depends how long the tissue is processed in the primary pathology work center. The time should be pretty much the same as in our center, so 48 hours, around 40 hours. Then it all depends on the decision of the local or regional pathologist how quickly, how flexibly they decide that this specimen should be sent for reference consultancy, that is us, or oncologist in a, they can ask the, the regional pathologist to deliver the tissue or the specimen to our center. So the, the time intervals are very different, and it's very difficult to, to give you an average. Sometimes it takes several days, sometimes, unfortunately, even several weeks until we are able to consult on this biopsy. What can you find out from this, uh, from this histology analysis? Well, the histology gives us a lot of information. If I may use, 
I, I would perhaps correct you here. I wouldn't use the word histology. I know that you, you and the assistant professor, using the term histology is historically correct. But if I, if I look at the specimen under microscope, I carry out histology analysis, and there are always histology historical methods referred to. But today. We have further specialized methods involve histochemical analysis, immunohistochemical analysis that, uh, by the way, uh, result in a longer times of uh, testing or examinations, more than 24 hours. So we prefer the term biopsy or biopsy examination, but we can refer to it as histology now for the sake of this event. Well, we need, we need to apply dichotomy dichotomy decision. So we we believe that oncology becomes a can cancer becomes a cancer when it's uh, confirmed by uh, the pathologist. This is the first parameter. So we have this dichotomy uh, decision making. Is it cancer or is it not cancer? If it is cancer, is it benign or malign? Again, dichotomy. Uh, and in case it's a cancer, every pathologist needs to def determine three types of things, types of cancer, types of tumor. Secondly, if the specimen enables, we, we, are, we, are, grading the, the, we are grading the tumor. And in case of large uh, biopsy, resection biopsy, we are, <coughs> uh, we are determining post-operative staging the evaluation of a potential metastasis in lymphatic uh, system or other locations. So these are the, the major points of histology. But today we also uh, examine other, uh, other important factors. These are the so-called biomarkers of cancer diseases. But I think we are going to talk about biomarkers later. Yes, we certainly will. I wanted to ask you, how long do all these things take? What's the turnaround time for this clinical oncologist for, from, for, for the histology uh, testing? What's the turnaround time? Well, there's a problem to say. It's difficult to say because how long the clinical oncologist waits for the, for the results depends on the number of tests. Uh, we are supposed to send the histology results to the workplace that sent us the material. So, so we had a bronchoscopy uh, specimen, and the the bronchoscopy uh, specialist from the, uh, the uh, from the hospital in Martin sends it to me. I send the results to the bronchoscopies in Martin. I have no idea when the clinical oncologists receive the the test results. So again, we send the we send the histology results to the to the entity who send us the tissue if it's a clinical uh, physician to the clinical physician but if it's a uh, but if it's a pathologist we send it to pathologists and we have no idea how long it takes for the pathologist to uh, to the physician so if it's a consultancy we send it to the work center that asked for this consultancy consultancy and if the application says that this was required by a clinical uh, oncologist uh, in Kosice then we send the specimen to them as well. So how long does it take to send this result? Well, test result is sent in a written form, so by mail. If it is in the university hospital in Martin, it's an internal post system in our, uh, in our hospital. But of course, every hospital has, uh, um, has information, internal information system. So w when we give the histology to the pathologist, we automatically feed in the result in the university information system. And then it becomes available, and any physician that sees the given patient in the given hospital will see the results. If this is a consultancy for a different clinical uh, physician or different pathology work center, we send it by standard mail. And if we know that which doctor required required the the testing we send the results also to this clinical oncologist uh, coded with an email so that we accelerate the whole process 
Okay, uh, histology is a golden standard, right? But as you mentioned, there is also superstructure in uh, identification of biomarkers using NGS, next generation sequencing. So let's look at this method, what exactly this means. What is gene sequencing? And is it this is it a standard in Slovakia? And if not, why not? Thank you for the question. It's a relatively complex question. Let me put it this way. In general, we know that cancer is basically a genetically conditioned disease. So a change of a standard cell to a cancer cell is usually caused by a genetic change, by a mutation or alteration of the cell. So the proliferation of a tumor and, and, and uh, expansion of the tumor or, or proliferation of tumor across the organism is driven by a genetic uh, mutation, the so-called driver mutation. To identify this genetic alteration, we apply various uh, genetic methods. And the question of gene sequencing that you mentioned can be can be basically uh, classified as a genomic method of second generation genetic analysis. Uh, uh, in the beginning, 10 or 15 years ago, when we were starting with these processes, we were we were examining the, the mutation or testing uh, the mutation uh, through first generation sequencing. So we were finding the, the protein in the in the cancer cancer cell or we were proving proving uh, the, 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 the cancer through isolation of DNA. But this is a complicated method, because if we have a model of lung carcinoma, we know that in the Central European population, including Slovaks, uh, for example, non-small lung cell carcinoma is 15 to 20 percent patients is conditioned most frequently by mutation of this gene, Ebendorfer. So in the first stage, we we check this for Edofer. If it's negative, we follow the statistically uh, we follow the statistics, which is the second most frequent gene, and we check for the second gene. And this is of course extended because if we need to check the sequence of three or four genes, say, uh, testing of each of these genes takes 24 to 72 hours, and until we arrive to a complex testing of all necessary genetic alteration, it takes a long time. Sequencing methods, on the other hand, or second generation sequencing method, uh, NGS as we know them, next generation sequencing, or massive parallel sequencing as we also know it, it saves, we, 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 can, we, can check, we can test the whole panel of all relevant genes and we can give the information to the clinical uh, oncologist uh, rather quickly and he or she knows which biomarker, so which genetic alteration is responsible for the proliferation. Let me return to my original question. Is gene sequencing a standard in Slovakia? Is it a standard? Well, it has become a standard in the most, re free, most recent 10 to 15 years, also uh, with the contribution of our work, work center using the first generation sequencing. Uh, testing uh, of the cancer tissue using uh, NGS so far, as, as far as I know, is not a standard, even though that I know about some centers, especially Central Oncology um, Work Centers of the National Oncology Institute or Oncology Institute of St. Elizabeth, and also partially our team in the University Hospital, uh, and also the laboratory of the, of the Martin, uh, faculty hospital that is gradually in introducing NGS into testing, but I f certainly wouldn't call it a standard. So how about the EU countries? Is it a standard in the EU? Well, you mentioned that Slovakia has a unique chance of uh, using all these uh, financial subsidies that are related to the recovery plan. I, I, I believe it would be a big shame, it would be a big sin if we if we neglect this because in if we talk about all the EU members the countries all the countries of EU NGS is already a standard we know it according to um, ESMA recommendations or guidelines the European Society for Medical Oncology and we do all we can to make sure that NGS becomes a standard in Slovak Republic as well because if we if we look at the if you look at in the Czech Republic only, in number of areas, the NGS analysis are becoming a standard. Professor, what do we know today 
what can we uh, what can we find out about the given type of cancer using gene sequencing and what's the meaning what's the, what's the benefit for the patient and their treatment well here i'm getting to the, the edge of my competence and my scientific knowledge because this should perhaps be answered by clinical oncologists but let me i'll try to answer as simply as possible Previous methods of treating cancer diseases were either surgical, so you the surgery of the of the of the cancer, or chemotherapy or radiotherapy. But using this genetic analysis, we determine we the, we disclose the genetic changes. Now we have two ways how to influence a treatment of cancer diseases using modern approaches. It's either personalized medicine or immunotherapy. Basically, the principle of these both approaches is that the given drug in this precision medicine or personalized medicine blocks the signals in the cell of the cancer at the level of this gene that we find out that has been mutated, this altered gene. That's one thing. Or the second possibility, in case of immunotherapy, our specialized methods can detect that the cancer cell adjust it and it and it basically it was hidden from the immuno, immuno, immune system we detect the cell and by a specific immune therapy we can kick start or support the immune system to destroy what it should destroy and and cancer cell is is a alliance cell and that needs to be destroyed by the immune system and if the immune system is kick-started correctly it can destroy the cancer tissue so to sum this up modern clinical pathology has moved from the primary diagnostic level to become a partner of the multidisciplinary team that was mentioned also by head Tipkova at this with the so-called two more boards and the results of our work can be very important in setting the correct personalized treatment of the patient thank you very much now let's return back to you assistant professor Koretz sorry associate professor Koretz uh, how can AI help us in planning surgery and planning the treatment of the patient uh, could we move to the next slide? Yeah, okay, it's good. Well, let me return to slide nine again, and then we look at this. Now we went from biopsy to pathologist, and I like to appreciate Professor Planck and his progressive approach. And I like to emphasize how morphology diagnosis is important. So the microscopic picture genome analysis, of course, and Professor also mentioned personalized treatment. Yes, even if we if we uh, uh, detect the histology finding and decide about the ideal treatment, we we would we could use assisted decision making uh, from the AI. And now let's go to the next slide. And this these AI systems, uh, we already know approximately 500 genes that are included in the oncogenesis. N novel genome tests and genome analysis, this ne next generation or mass parallel sequencing, as, as Professor mentioned, enables us to to test for 350 genes. We can select seven or eight that are statistically relevant for this type of cancer. Each of these genes has mutation at a different position. It's very difficult for a physician to process this without help by, uh, by, uh, by without help from artificial intelligence. Moreover, there's morphology finding, so the picture, the imaging, then the clinical finding, and all of this, to summarize all of this and to select from these five potential uh, tr uh, therapies for personalized treatment, that's a difficult stuff. It cannot be done reliably without assistance by AI or at least correctly digitalized standards. And moreover, if we reduce the indication, if we make it more precise, and from these p potential patients, there could be five potential candidate genes, 
sorry, candidate patients. We can choose choose two or three pa patients who have double chance of responding to the chemotherapy. Again, the result is higher uh, likelihood of success. There is improvement of, in mortality. And we save uh, the funds because we don't treat the patients with expensive therapy if they don't stand the chance to respond to this particular treatment. And again, AI-assisted selection of the ideal treatment can uh, result in a more precise indication and, as Professor pointed out, personalized treatment. So specific tailor-made therapy for this, for this specific patient when the effect is maximum. Well, thank you very much. Now we are moving along uh, this patient pathway to treatment. And there is a very interesting slide. Okay, three slides to be more precise. The first says that in Slovakia there are only 22% of modern oncology therapies reimbursed and almost 80 almost 80% 80 are not available for Slovak patients. Another slide. Thanks to development of uh, research in medicine there are drugs or therapies which uh, which can treat oncology patients or cancer, uh, lung cancer patients. There are 27 lung cancer therapies, but only three of them are available in Slovakia. And the last slide of these three is the availability of these modern therapies and it compares the respective countries. Basically, we select the economically very similar countries, similar economies of the CEE region. And we still see Slovakia is not doing very well, because when we compare our neighbors like Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, we have only 38% of modern therapies available for our patients. This is data provided by the Association of the Innovative Pharmaceutical Industry. This is data validated from February this year and the association even have more recent data, which will be published in several weeks. But as far as I know, this gap between Slovakia and other countries is even bigger now. So it's even worse. So my question to Ms. Cipkova, the head of the East Slovakia Oncology Institute, is the data correct according to your experience? Yes, yes. Innovative therapies are a problem in uh, Slovakia because these are usually therapies that are they are registered. Uh, I mean, in the EU, but they are not categorized. This means that these drugs needs to be uh, applied for with the spe special exception, and and the the and the health insurance company need to approve this. As a clinical oncologist, is this a problem for you when setting? Uh, treatment for your oncology patients, for your cancer, pa cancer patients? Well, I always support the idea that in the first wave of the of treatment, the patient be should be given the most e effective therapy. So if the patient meets the conditions for innovative treat therapy, they should be indicated innovative therapy. I would like to I know that it's uh, the first line treatment is difficult to decide on because the patient is insured in this insu health insurance company or that insurance company and the health insurance companies have different standards their systems differ so some of them uh, approve this therapy into first line the other uh, approves this uh, therapy with the second or third line ter treatment you know you know it's not a problem to fill in the application to uh, to approve of the exception but if you indicate this uh, therapy, you know about the indication limits and the therapy should be approved. However, we need to take to into account that not all patients are co uh, correct adept for, for example, immunotherapy. It's mentioned in the media very often, but you know, a patient needs to May, may needs to meet certain criteria like uh, physical status, renal parameters, comorbidities, etc., etc. So the treatment needs to be indicated reasonably and only for suitable patients. Well, let me now give you a personal experience. It's not lung cancer, but I have a friend and she suffers from advanced metastatic 
cancer of breast, breast carcinoma. Her clinical oncologist recommended her modern uh, tr uh, therapy. However, it was not approved by one private health insurance company. The, her health care, health status was very, very serious. She was in pain and they decided to sell the car and invest their own family savings into the treatment. And the patient is on the sick leave, uh, therapy for she has been taking it for six months and I had a phone call last week and, and, he, and her uh, husband was so happy and she went to a comprehensive testing the metastatic development in bones stopped the cancer is not spreading to other organs she feels good she doesn't have to wear a corset they can go to trips uh, you know they can hi go hiking and this innovative therapy was clearly very beneficial for the patient but unfortunately only after a media pressure this private health insurance company i believe a few weeks ago reimbursed the therapy and they gave her the you know exception eva how was this in your case when it comes to treatment I think it was very similar, but I'm lucky not to be in at this horrible phase. I so far hope I have no metasta metastatic, metastatic uh, phase, but I'm taking immunotherapy. I've been taking immunotherapy for two years, but before that I've gone through a number of things. Also, I had to use some media pressure. You know, after first surgery, I went to uh, chemotherapy. It didn't work. After one year, there was another uh, two more on the other side of lungs, but the CT showed that there are no metastases. There's just one single tumor. So the doctor decided to for surgery. It wasn't simple. I was operated again at the chest surgical clinics. And before that, I even went to radiotherapy in the National Oncology Institute. But the radiology and chemotherapy didn't help. I needed new surgery. Then the doctor decided, OK, we will wait. We'll see how it's going to develop. They didn't give me any therapy for some time, but I felt bad. So I called the doctor and the doctor arranged another CT very quickly. And the CT showed that the cancer is back again. Uh, I had some, some spreading across uh, my lungs and uh, the doctor decided to give me a different chemotherapy, more demanding or stronger. And I took this chemo and in the meantime, they were deciding whether they will refer me to to Prague to to proton proton therapy proton therapy to Prague but naturally across the uh, all along they had known that immunotherapy could help me seriously they had known this from the very first uh, tissue uh, histology analysis and after surgery it turned out that the chances even higher so the health insurance company approved the proton therapy because it was uh, recommended by the National Oncology Institute, but they didn't approve the immunotherapy, even though that my uh, my physician, my clinical oncologist, uh, applied for it. Then we decided that I will still uh, go into the immunotherapy. So there was a public, there was a media pressure. Yes, there was media pressure because I know the, I have uh, quite a lot of good connections. People know me from the media personally or f through my work. So the interest of the media was really big and it really helped me. And when I went to Prague, uh, uh, I had the six week uh, treatment and I received uh, information that the, the insurance company uh, ha decided to reimburse the treatment. And of course, every three months, I have to reapply for the immunotherapy again and again. It once happened that it took uh, more time so I had to pay some of it from my own pocket. So I've been taking this immunotherapy for two years. And if I didn't see my uh, my physician every th once in three weeks, I wouldn't even know I'm I have I'm a cancer patient. So so how do you feel today? I feel totally OK. I work. I, I do sports. I uh, I do exactly like any other person. I basically have no health problems, no side effects. And I'm saying, you know, if I didn't see my my doctor once in three weeks to receive this uh, uh, this infusion for half an hour, I wouldn't have an idea that I have uh, that I have cancer. Of course, uh, every three months I I have to wait for the CT results, so it's a psychological pressure, and I'm afraid, of course. But otherwise, I feel really good.
So we clearly benefit from the treatment. Yes, clearly. Ms. Tipkova, my question for you, talking about uh, treatment, do you communicate with patients uh, about all the possibilities of treatment that you say that this is a this therapy needs to be approved by the health insurance company uh, or there is an, a, a therapy but it's not available in Slovakia or when you select the therapy you only you only uh, give what is available and what is approved by the health insurance companies well naturally we do communicate about all types of treatment with the patient when it comes to the possibilities we have we we have no problem with giving chemos these are a class drugs second category or second line are registered categorized therapies this includes also most uh, targeted biological drugs these drugs are usually not a problem for a first line treatment however the registered and non-categorized therapies are a problem and we need to apply for an exception we need to inform the patient because you know cancer patients are afraid of their relatives are even more afraid so there's a huge pressure on us and the patients want to start therapy as soon as possible health insurance companies however they have certain time for approval of the exception is usually 30 days and we communicate with the patient we want to explain them yes we've sent the application but we need to give the various results of tests uh, that the health insurance company requires for the approval so the patient needs to go through some tests and then the application is sent to the health insurance companies it is decided <coughs> centrally in Bratislava so the waiting time is around one month what's your experience with health insurance companies we will not give specific names whether it is a state or a private health insurance company do they approve these therapies or not are they ca cautious well it's important to determine the basic biomarkers when these innovative therapies can be indicated in case of registered categorized drugs there's not a problem the other drugs sorry therapies some you know some insurance companies have different criteria for example in case of uh, of a pdl1 score which is over 50 percent one insurance company approves the given therapy right for the first line the other only for the second line treatment so this is the biggest problem so we we are not fully able to indicate the treatment according to these markers because uh, it it, this doesn't only involve uh, lung uh, cancer, but we have uh, there are different types of cancer that also uh, involve more difficult, more complicated approval process. Uh, yesterday, I spoke to Professor Yesenyak from uh, University Hospital in Martin, and he said that the communication between the physician and the health insurance company about the approval it's a huge administrative burden for the physician themselves and it significantly takes away their time so the time he or she could invest in treating the patient seeing the patient they have to spend by communicating with a health insurance company is it so yes certainly this is a problem as Ms. Latko also mentioned the therapies even if they are approved they are approved for a limited time usually for three months only and then you have to retest you have to prove the benefit of the therapy and reapply again and again so if you realize how many patients a clinical oncologist sees or how many patients are in his or her care then this is really very demanding in terms of time because the, the therapies that are registered and categorized they have the so-called protocol with them and you need to fill in this protocol usually it's several pages it has to be filled in it has to be sent so there is a loss of time with this administrative burden and this this burden is really very very high thank you very much again let's uh, talk to you assistant professor we said that the innovation can increase efficiency of uh, healthcare they can um, accelerate the patient pathway and personalized healthcare can uh, result in targeted treatment of patients so if you on one hand invest into digitalization of healthcare into modern technology 
And there's a unique opportunity today because we have this operating program of the recovery fund from the EU. So if we save money using the modern technology, this money, these, these funds can be used to invest into uh, innovative, modern innovative therapies, right? Yes, certainly so. And if we, if all of this process, this pathway is simplified, and if we build this on a single communication software and it involves uh, pathology, clinical findings, we arrive to personalized treatment on the very uh, far right side, and then the clinical oncologist doesn't need to provide reasons that he or she only gives the findings or submits the findings and you know even with the in the communication with the insurance company you just say to the insurance company here you are these are all the data about the patient just go and look at it the the the, the patient pathway is is provided within the these standards and in that case, the health insurance company knows immediately this is the best, best therapy, this is the therapy selected based on the AI uh, recommendation, which will go through 10,000 of clinical studies if necessary. It is the most efficient, uh, uh, most uh, effective economically. Uh, it is simplified for the clinical oncologist, simplified for the health insurance companies, but first of all, we will provide the most effective treatment to the patient and the ministry needs to know the insurance needs to know that this is the financially most effective solution it's very important it's a win all solution we call this a backbone or inter uh, or a backbone of the IT healthcare system why this is not working in slovakia do we need to uh, change the legislation what is important so that we can use this backbone IT system. Well, yes, you said it correctly, we need to change the legislation also, but there were certain uh, attempts to develop this software, a lot of universal software, a lot of money was spent, but the software wasn't usable, wasn't as practical as, as, as we expected it to be. It is now being uh, uh, modified and the money from the EU funds, if we use it here, this can increase in this can result in increasing efficiency of treatment. So again, this is my call to the responsible authorities. This is the area in oncology where we certainly need to invest so that we save later. Why don't we have the standard for pathway of the oncology or cancer patients in the system? Well, one thing is standard pathway. The other thing is standard for diagnostics and treatment. You know, we, we, we do have certain pathways standardized like GP, specialist, biopsy, clinical oncologist and treatment. So that's the standardized pathway. But what is still difficult are diagnostic standards and therapeutical standards. And we want to lean upon these standards that are recommended by the European Union and European Society for Medical Oncology. These are the standards we'd like to adopt, modify and say, right, Minister, healthcare minister said 70% of innovation will be reimbursed, we'll, we will reimburse the most, recent, the most advanced medical procedures. This is recommended and let someone make, let's make someone responsible for not reimbursing these. Well, several times we talk about the slide 9, this backbone IT system. Is there any pilot project uh, running today that we could be able, we would be able to see the practical implications? Well, this is a, an appeal from the discussion. There are these, this backbone is, has already been designed, been designed by a number of software developers. We are finalizing the development with one of the companies. And there's just one step to be made to put this into practice. And with these top level uh, work centers, We've already communicated how this could be uh, implemented, and we are convinced, or we, we hope, that in spring this European money could be used to finance the project. So the answer, yes, we are already preparing pilot projects. Okay, we are advancing to the end of the discussion. We have last two slides we wanted to cover. We call them as quick wins and system solutions or system changes. Uh, I'd like to ask you, the physicians, let's call, let's look at the, the slides that we call quick wins. If you could choose two or three 
priorities that needs to be implemented very quickly. If they are not in the list, of course, you can you can obviously uh, you can obviously give us your personal opinion. Assistant Professor, you're the cl uh, Associate Professor, you're closest to me, so you can start. Okay, there are six points. Which of them is the most important? It's very difficult to say. All six are very correctly selected, and all six are well um, formulated. Now, oncology treatment is a complex thing. And if we only amend a single step, uh, we don't amend the whole system. We will not reach the result. So I would have to I would have to vote for all six of these quick wins. Okay, we have one minute and a half to go, uh, Ms. Tipkova. Well, we certainly want to follow uh, the European standards and recommendations and guidelines of uh, oncology treatment. I only want to point out that this. Uh, treatment poly therapy uh, drug policy is not unified, so it would be good to have unified uh, drug policy in the EU countries. I would, I would appreciate, as a clinical oncologist, that the first-line treatment could also involve indication of the most efficient therapy, so really accelerate uh, approval uh, of auditing physicians in the health insurance company so that we can give the therapy to the patient as soon as possible. Well, I would, I would say that the point four has already been implemented, national biobanks. So I can proudly say that the agreement on the project of national biobank has already been signed and executed, and we are about to basically to to to, to launch the project, and it's already we already have funding for that. So national biobank is already done, and and. And you also, you also had the the, the point two, the, um, uh, the payment of NGS in uh, healthcare, uh, in healthcare reimbursement involved. So, well, well, we also need to make sure that predictive testing of biomarkers is reimbursed. This is also unsettled or this unresolved question, not only NGS, but also predictive bio biomarkers. Thank you very much. Now let's look at the systemic changes. So we again, we have this, we will have this short round of answers. Which of these systemic changes would you emphasize? You know, this standard processes and procedures in uh, therapy and diagnosis, they already exist. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we need to adapt them to slow back conditions where they can be applied. The unified IT system, uh, communication and communication between physicians absolutely essential, absolutely essential. That's a, that's a, to the condition sine qua non. So these are only designs, guidelines are also, yeah, this coming back to this unique IT system, this will, this, this should at least be operational for at least to the 70% level or the accessibility of innovative uh, therapies at least to 70% like the other countries. Uh, primary and specialized care. Yes, perhaps we should increase the competence of GPs. And the sooner we start the pilot project, the better, so that we are not only a country that copies, that we, so that we are not only a copycat, but we could also be we could also be uh, racing at the Olympics, so that we can become the first league. You know, Ms. Tipkova. Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't see the slides with the systemic changes. Okay, now I see, but I don't see correctly. Well, for me, the key important thing is the accessibility of innovative therapies that we could provide to the patient, because we are often included in a number of clinical studies where we can evaluate the benefits of the novel therapies for overall survival and improved time until progression. So that's, you know, accessibility of innovative ther therapies. That's the key thing. Professor? Yeah, I agree with everything that has been said. And let me summarize two things. Standards, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Let's follow the advanced countries. And secondly, in IT systems, let's resolve the National Oncology Register of the Slovak Republic because it's dysfunctional. Thank you very much.
I believe we arrived at the end of our discussion. So let me summarize this. Slovakia is facing a unique chance to draw funds from the recovery fund, but also from operational program of the EU. And it would be really great if at least one part of these funds was invested into healthcare and healthcare that could be called that it's a modern, digital and efficient healthcare so that it primarily it benefits the patient, the physician, and after all, the government, the state as such. I believe this was a good leeway, a good starting point for, for interesting discussion. I hope we will continue also in the future. But now I'd like to uh, thank my uh, our guests, the patient and, um, and uh, journalist Eva Slatkova, Associate Professor Stefan Koretz. Thank you very much. I was honored, and I believe this was an essentially important project. This is an essentially important project. Also, we'd like to thank head physician Andrea Cipkova from East Slovakian Oncology Institute, who enabled us to be with you today. Thank you again. And Professor uh, Lukas Plank, thank you for inviting me. I was honored. And thank to Peter Lipovsky, uh, GP who had to disconnect around 10 o'clock because he had to treat or see his patients. And I'd like to thank you, all of you who were watching us through our online streaming. And I wish you a pleasant day and a weekend. Bye.